Today is a very special day for us as Lutherans. Because today, we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the translation of the New Testament by Martin Luther into German. It was in September 1522 that Luther's New Testament in German was translated and printed. Now, the entire Bible by, that was translated through Martin Luther was done in 1534, but it was September 1522 that Martin Luther's New Testament was first printed. And for 500 years, we as Lutherans have stood boldly in the doctrine of sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Any teaching that we do, any preaching that we do must be based, must have its foundation in scripture. And so today we celebrate with joy Martin Luther's 500th anniversary of the New Testament. Today is also a very special day for me personally because on September 24th, which would have been yesterday, 1972, I was ordained into the ministry of Word and Sacrament at First English Lutheran Church, Austin, Texas. So today, I celebrate 50 years of ordination. And I give thanks to God for the privilege and the blessing that I have had in this ministry. Ten years spent in parish ministry in Texas and Louisiana, and 40 years in missions in Botswana, Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya, Africa. So today is a very special day for me. 500 years of translation, 50 years of ordination. Now when I talk to people often, when I talk to people about Bible translation, one of the first and probably the most prevalent question I'm ever given is, do we really need to translate the Bible these days? Many countries, people learn English, in many countries, like where I work, they speak Swahili, the national language, or in Botswana, Setswana, the national language. And we know that in Germany, there was the German Bible, France, the French Bible, and then et cetera, et cetera. So why translate into these minority languages? First of all, I can assure you that while it is true many countries do teach English in school, that language is usually for the educated and only used in government or tourist industry or in some businesses. It is true that maybe if you walk around the streets and try to find your directions, you can find somebody that can speak some kind of English and give you directions. But there's not enough understanding to sit down and read the scripture. I would say 98% of the people spend most of their time speaking actually in their heart language, the vernacular they learn from their mothers and fathers, their aunts and uncles at home. Even if they know English, they would rather hear God's word in their own language. And I ask you a question, does a person have to learn a foreign language just to know that God loves them. Pastor Jonathan has shown us this morning, showed the children the Bible, he showed the Hebrew Bible, the Greek Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament. That would be technically our Bible. So what it would be like this morning if I stood up and said, okay, give me the Hebrew Bible, let me read it, and then said my whole sermon in Hebrew. How many of you would uh, understand? Okay. <laughs> or how many of you would be willing to go to school and learn? Or even if I, you know, I teach, I preach in three or four different languages. If I started teaching to you right now in 
Swahili ningeantu kongea nani kiswahili na kubiri kiswahili habari ya Yesu Kristo wangapi wangeelewa how many of you have understood now would you be willing to go to school and learn to understand so why should that 70 80 year old woman or man out in the village who has never heard of the Bible spend time and money go learn English just so they can learn about Jesus Christ And I could also say that even if you learn a foreign language to understand scripture, you never really understand. It's superficial. I speak, like I said, three, four languages. I can preach, teach at any time in those languages. But I assure you that when I come here to church on Sunday morning or go to Wednesday Bible study, and hear it in English, it is so much more relaxing, refreshing, and understandable. And my wife always says, yeah, I can go listen to you preach in Swahili, but I never really know what you're saying. <laughs> now, she can go to the market and haggle and get the tomatoes for half the price in Swahili, but when it comes to listening to God's word. I've used this example before. Perhaps you've heard it, I might have used it in one of my devotions earlier, but I think it's worth repeating. It's an experience I had in Botswana when I was working with the Kalanga on their Bible translation. And one of the things we do is to gather people from time to time to listen to the translation and to make sure that we're using the right words, the right kind of discourse, narrative, etc. So I'd gathered some pastors from that neighborhood who spoke Kalanga as their first language to read through the book of Romans with me. And as we were reading it, I, I know that most of these men and women knew English and Setswana had been preaching on English or Setswana for years. Now they're reading it for the first time in their own language in Kalanga, Kalanga. And after we read through the book of Romans, I said, what do you say? How do you, how do you judge? Was the translation good? And there was total silence. And then finally, one of the men looked up and he said, now we understand. After all those years of reading in English and Setswana, they had never really heard what the Apostle Paul was saying. I've even seen entire communities transformed once they heard the word of God in their own language. Remember one time my evangelism team, we went to a small village there in Tanzania. We knew before going there that it was a village that had not received Jesus Christ in any way. They were still traditional religion. They were under the power of the local shaman. But we went anyway, and we were preaching, going house to house. We spent three days going house to house, preaching, teaching, talking to people. Every evening we show the Jesus film, talk to them about it the next day, continue. I even had some of the evangelists going to where the shaman was working, talking to the people there that were trying to get the evil spirits cast out of them or the curses lifted from the ancestors. My team and I walked into one house. It was an elderly woman, I would say between 70 and 75 years of age. Her eyes were just swollen shut, red. She could hardly see, probably because she'd been cooking over a smoky fire in her house for 70 years. And one of the team members that was on my team was a doctor, and he said, why don't you come to the hospital and we'll treat you, give you some medicine. And she said, no, I can't do that. I'm too poor. Well, we could see tins of grain that she had harvested that were sitting there that she could sell. But even so, Tanzania has socialized medicine. And so the doctor said, you can come free. I'll give you the medicine free. And she said, no, this is a curse from the ancestors. I have to go to the shaman. I have to give him my grain as payment. And so we talked with her and prayed with her. And when we left the village, we left a young evangelist there to teach and to help them learn about Jesus Christ. 
About eight months later, my team and I returned to that village and we were surprised to see almost everyone in the village had been transformed and converted to following Jesus Christ. And it came about that the shaman himself had decided to accept Jesus. He called all the village together, burned all of his charms, all of his medicines and everything. He says, now we will file, follow the true light. Now we'll follow Christ. And they had all changed. They all accepted Christ. They were wearing new clothes. They had even gathered stones and material and money to build their own church. Just because they received the word of God in their own language. They could hear and they could understand. Not too long ago, been about three weeks, I was in Dallas at the memorial service for my sister-in-law who has just passed away. And during the sermon, the pastor mentioned something about reading the good news every day. So after the sermon and we were out having our coffee and having a little snacks and everything, I introduced myself to the pastor and told him I was a Bible translator. And he whips out his phone and he holds it up and he said, I have an app on my phone that has 100 Bibles. Now, I admit, I was a little cynical at that point. Now, usually I'm not cynical, and if I ever show any cynicism towards you, please forgive me. But there was something in my mind that said, and do you read all 100 Bibles every day? And are they all in English, or are they in Spanish or French? What about the millions and millions of people in the world that don't even have one verse of the Bible in their language? How can they read the good news every day? Now, I'm not against Bible apps. I have so many Bibles on my computer and Bible, it's almost like I can't even count them all in many different languages. But I also know that there's a millions of people that have none. I encourage you to have Bibles. I encourage you to read the Bible. I encourage you to come to church every Sunday to hear the scripture, to come Wednesday evenings to hear the scripture studied, talk about it. That's our Bible story. That's our history, our story. That's who we are, God's children saved in the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the good news. In the words of Simon Peter today, that we read this morning, we must first go back and look at the context in which those words were spoken. The time of Christ was not just a very peaceful, Everybody does everything nice, and there was nice and easy life. It was a very confusing time. It was a very chaotic time. They were under colonialism. People were literally being crucified every day. A rich man could just go and make a complaint about a slave and had him scourged and crucified. There was economic chaos. People were looking for some kind of life, some kind of light. And when Jesus started talking about discipleship, some of the people said, uh-uh, it's not for us. We want that magic, wave the wand and everything be okay. Elect the right politician and we'll have our freedom today. And so they turned away from Christ. Peter said, uh, Jesus said, okay, what about you guys here, you 12? And Peter said those beautiful words, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. What about the people in Africa? Lost in shamanism, lost in the night of darkness, of evil, of ancestor curse, of ancestor worship, economic chaos, poverty. To whom shall they go? Jesus is the only one with the words of eternal life. But how can they know about Jesus if they don't have a Bible in their own language? 
The sermon hymn today is one of my favorites. It's a difficult one to sing, I know. It's a melody that's not very familiar, but I love the words. And I hope when we sing it that we look at every word, but I want to quote right now just the second verse. Must we be vainly awaiting the morrow? Shall those who have light, no light, let us borrow, giving no heed to our burden of sorrow? Will you help us soon? Will you help us soon? I can say, I can see the faces of many of my friends and many people I see in Africa saying those very words to us today. Will you help us soon? Will you help us soon? We have the light. We have the technology. We have the finances. We have the training. We have the love of Christ in our hearts. All they're asking us for us to share that with them, that they too might have the words of eternal life. 50 year, 500 years ago, Martin Luther saw the same thing in Germany. Under the Roman Empire, he wanted his people to know, clearly understand the word of God, sola scriptura. And so he translated scripture into the German language. So we as Lutherans for 500 years have that tradition. And I've been privileged for the last 50 years to participate that, especially in the times of doing Bible translation. And so I'm saying, I'm asking, I'm encouraging you to pray for us, to pray for those who don't even know one verse, that they might find a way to have their Bible so that they can hold that Bible, they can identify with that Bible, they can read that Bible, they can know eternal life. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so to ever who believeth in him shall not perish, but to have everlasting life. Amen.